We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombings, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, the mainstream media, social justice, critical race theory, COVID-19, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with it. No one has any vision of a different or a better kind of future. This is a story about how over the past 40 years, politicians, finances and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead they constructed a simpler version of the world in order to hang on to power and as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. Even those who thought they were attacking the system, the radicals, the artists, the musicians, and our whole counterculture, actually became part of the trickery. Because they too had retreated into the make-believe world, which is why their opposition has no effect, and nothing ever changes. But this retreat into a dream world allowed dark and destructive forces to fester and grow outside. Forces that are now returning to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. The original dream of the Soviet Union had been to create a glorious new world. A world where not only the system, but the people themselves would be transformed. They would become new and better kinds of human beings. By the 1980s, it was clear that the dream had failed. The Soviet Union became instead a society where no one believed in anything. No real vision of the future. Странная прическа. Где тебя так красиво подстригли? Знакомлюсь с панками московскими, они подстригли. А что это за течение это панки? Ну это люди, которые любят свободу, там тебя подносили там. А ты не свободна, да? Свободна. 
Ну, мне кажется, у тебя что-то случилось. Да, у тебя ничего не случилось. У меня ничего не потом тогда расскажешь. Потом я понимаю, что тебе сейчас трудно говорить. В следующий раз расскажешь. Десять раз и снова Никто не знает, как же мне хуёво И телевизор с потолка свисает И как хуёво мне никто не знает Все это до того подзаебало Что хочется опять начать сначала Куплет печальный Those around the Soviet Union had believed that they could plan and manage a new kind of socialist society. They had discovered that it was impossible to control and predict everything, and the plan had run out of control. But rather than reveal this, the technocrats began to pretend that everything was still going according to plan. And what emerged instead was a fake version of society. The Soviet Union became a society where everyone knew that what their leaders said was not real. Because they could see with their own eyes that the economy was falling apart. But everybody had to play along and pretend that it was real. Because no one could imagine any alternative. One Soviet writer coined a new word for such a phenomenon. Hypernormalization. You were so much a part of the system that it was impossible to see beyond it. The fakeness was hypernormal. In this stagnant world, two brothers, known as Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, became the inspiration of a growing new dissident movement. They weren't politicians, they were science fiction writers, and in their stories, they express the strange mood that was rising up as the Soviet Empire collapsed. Their most famous book was called Roadside Picnic. It is set in a world that seems like the present, except there is a zone that has been created by an alien force. People known as stalkers go into the zone. They find that nothing is what it seems, that reality changes minute by minute. Shadows go the wrong way. There are hidden forces that twist your body and change the way you think and feel. The picture the Strugatskys gave was of a world where nothing was fixed. Both what you saw and what you believe had become shifting and unstable. And in 1979, the film director, Andrei Tarkovsky made a film that was based on Roadside Picnic. Что случилось? Зачем вы меня остановили? Я вас не останавливал. А кто? Вы? Черт его. The new president of America had a new vision of the world. It wasn't the harsh realism of Henry Kissinger any longer, which was different. 
It was a simple moral crusade where America had a special destiny. To fighting evil and to make the world a better place. The places and the periods in which man has known freedom are few and far between. Just scattered moments on the span of time. And most of those moments have been ours. The American people have a genius for great and unselfish deeds. Into the hands of America, God has placed the destiny of an afflicted mankind. God bless America. But this crusade was going to lead Reagan to come face to face with Henry Kissinger's legacy, and above all, the vengeful fury of President Assad of Syria. Israel was now determined to finally destroy the power of the Palestinians. But in 1982, they sent a massive army to encircle the Palestinian accounts in the Lebanon. How strong the Israelis are. Do you know how many, how many tanks they have outside Beirut? Do you know how strong they are? I dashed into this building here because the PLO guys were expected that sooner or later there will be a huge explosion. There have been several of these in the last few minutes. As you can see, there's enormous damage in all the buildings around here. Two months later, thousands of Palestinian refugees were massacred. It horrified the world. But what was even more shocking was that Israel allowed it to happen. Its troops sat by and watched as a Christian Lebanese faction murdered the Palestinians. This was the first of the massacres we discovered yesterday. Now, 24 hours later, the stench here is appalling. But the effects on the Israelis of what their Christian allies did here, and in dozens of other places around this camp, are going to be immense. There's always been a risk of such massacres if Christian militiamen were allowed to come into Palestinian camps. And the Israelis seem to have done nothing to prevent them coming into this one. In the face of the horror of the growing chaos, President Reagan was forced to act. He announced that American Marines would come to Beirut to lead a peacekeeping force. Reagan insisted the troops were neutral, but President Assad was convinced of another reality. He saw the troops as part of the growing conspiracy between America and Israel to divide the Middle East into factions and destroy the power of the Arabs. Assad decided to get the Americans out of the Middle East. And to do this, he made an alliance with a new, revolutionary force of Ruhollah Khomeini's Iran. And what Khomeini could bring to Assad was an extraordinary new weapon he had just created. It was called the poor man's atomic bomb. Ruhollah Khomeini had come to power two years before, as the leader of the Iranian Revolution. But his hold on power was precarious. But Khomeini had developed a new idea on how to fight his enemies and defend the revolution. 
Khomeini told his followers that they could destroy themselves in order to save the revolution, providing that in the process they killed as many around them as possible. This was completely new, because the Quran specifically prohibits suicide. In the past, you became a martyr on the battlefield, because God chose the time and place of your death. But Khomeini changed this. He did it by going back to one of the central rituals of Shia Islam. Every year, Shiats march in a procession, mourning the sacrifice of their founder, Arsene. As they do, they whip themselves, symbolically reenacting Arsene's suffering. Khomeini said that the ultimate act of penance was not just to whip yourself, but to kill yourself, provided it was for the greater good of the revolution. Khomeini mobilized this force when the country was attacked by Iraq. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, good afternoon. An Iraqi Soviet-made MiG-23 was shot down by the Air Force jet fighters of the Islamic Republic over the northwestern Iranian border region of Marivan at 10.08 hours local time Saturday, said the Joint Staff Command's communique number 1710. Iran faced almost certain defeat because Iraq had far superior weapons, many of which were supplied by America. So the revolutionaries took tens of thousands of young boys out of schools, put them on buses and sent them to the front lines. Their job was to walk through the enemy's minefields, deliberately blowing themselves up in order to open gaps that would allow the Iranian army to pass through unharmed. It was organized suicide on a vast scale. This human sacrifice was commemorated in giant cemeteries across the country. Fountains flowing blood-red water glorified this new kind of martyrdom. And it was this new idea of an unstoppable human weapon that President Assad took from Khomeini and brought to the West for the first time. But as it traveled, it will mutate into something even more deadly. Instead of just killing yourself, you would take explosives with you into the heart of the enemy and then blow yourself up taking dozens or even hundreds along with you. It would become known as suicide bombing. In October, 1983, two suicide bombers drove trucks into the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut. It was seeing something move that took me out of my trance. And then I recognized, oh yes, Marines were in that building. A lot of Marines were in that building. And that's when I ran down and, and it was a black, black Marine. He looked white. The dust, it just covered him. The massive explosion killed 241 Americans. The bombers were members of a new militant group that no one had heard of. They called themselves Hezbollah. And although many of them were Iranian, they were very much under the control of Syria and the Syrian intelligence agencies. President Assad was using them as his proxies to attack America. Whoever carried out yesterday's bombings, Shia, Muslim fanatics, devotees of the Ayatollah Khomeini or whatever, it is Syria who profits politically. The most significant fact is that the dissidents live and work with Syrian protection. So it is to Syria, rather than to the dissident group's guiding light, Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran, that we must look for an explanation of the group's activities. Destabilization is Syria's Middle Eastern way of reminding the world that Syria must not be left out of plans for the future of the area. Our sorrow and grief 
over the loss of those splendid young men and the injury to so many others. But these deeds make so evident the bestial nature of those who would assume power if they could have their way and drive us out of that area. But despite his words, within four months, President Reagan withdrew all the American troops from the Lebanon. Secretary of State George Shultz explained. We became paralyzed by the complexity that we faced, he said. So the Americans turned and left. For President Assad, it was an extraordinary achievement. He was the only Arab leader to have defeated the Americans and forced them to leave the Middle East. He had done it by using the new force of suicide bombing. A force that once unleashed, was going to spread with unstoppable power. But at this point, both Assad and the Iranians thought that they could control it. And what gave it this extraordinary power was that it held out the dream of transcending the corruptions of the world and entering a new and better world. One should defend the realm of Islam and Muslims against heretics and invaders. And to fulfill this duty, one should even sacrifice one's life. We believe that martyrs can overlook our deeds from the other world. It means that after death, the martyr lives and can still witness this world.